Welcome to My Life, Chassidus Applied, episode 492. This program is in loving memory of Miriam Basalio, Altez Allah HaShalem, and in merit of Baruch bin Yomen, Ben Menuch Alana, Altez, Yikusil Ben Le'e Rochel, and Rochel Bas Liba Farkash, dedicated by Pinchas Tadris Ben Miriam, and Sarah Bas Rochel Altez. Okay, we're uh, about to end the second month of Adar in this leap year, entering into the month of Nisan, the Chedesh HaGeula, month of redemption. Nismach Geula as the Gemara says, that we uh, connect, and in a consecutive fashion, we go straight from the month of Adar, the Geula of Purim, and straight into the Geula of Nisan, the Geula of Mitzrayim. And what better time than now that we need Geula. Geula from all our challenges, especially in Eretz Yisrael, especially the Eden that are under attack. Hashem should protect all the holy soldiers who in turn are protecting and defending the men, women, and children in Eretz HaKedosh, Eretz HaSherene, Hashem HaLekechabo, Meresh HaShashonah, Bad Achrish a land that has unique divine providence all year round, and Eden and Jews everywhere, and human beings everywhere. And we should finally merit, in addition to the Gula Pratis, the personal redemption on a microcosmic level of each one of us, also global redemption, Gula Amitis Vashlema, Benissa Nigalu, Benissa Nasidin Ligoyal. So as we're about to enter this month of Nisan, may it be now, and then Bamela automatically will be Shlashan Habobi Rishalayim, that this Pesach will celebrate Yerushalayim with the Pesach the Shashlishi and the Karben Pesach and all that comes with the Geula. I had this Chus merit to meet one of the hostages that was freed a month ago. He was an Argentinian hostage and he was freed literally the day after when uh, we were in Eretz Yisrael. Myself, I accompanied the president of Argentina, Javier Milei, and he had prayed at the Kaisal, and then we danced in the dance of the beginning of month of Adar, Shanichnis Adar Marm Besimcha. So we're talking now, I'm actually almost close to two months, and that's Chus. It was pretty clear the next day, literally, was the release of the Sasha. So I met him just this a few days ago. It was a very moving, I gave him a copy of my book, Toward a Meaningful Life, in Spanish. He lives now in Erzisrael, and he was taken hostage in one of the kibbutzim. He was there with his family. And while we were sitting at meeting, Hashgacha Pratis, Divine Providence, it was 10.23 in the morning Friday, the earthquake here in the Northeast, which we shall talk about as well. I'm mentioning it because since we're talking about the war, we're talking about Gula, so Gula Pratis of an individual, that should lead to the Gula of all the hostages safe and secure. And as I said, a Gula for all the families and all the soldiers that are on the front lines doing the holiest thing a person can do, which is to protect the life of other individuals. So, yes, this is a time of Geula, a time of Simcha, paid it together. And as I shared with this, with this fellow, whose name is Louis, Louis, that Geula and Simcha is connected because the idea of paid it together, Simcha paid it together. It allows us the ability to pierce through all boundaries and all barriers. And that's indeed also the theme of Yitzhiz Mitzrayim, Yitzhiz Mitzrayim V'gvulim, to leave an exit and an exodus from all constraints and boundaries and limitations. So Hashem should bless for every one of us, every one of you, and every Yidel lover to have this, especially in this unique time. We know time is energy. This is the energy of Geula, the energy of Simcha, the energy of piercing through and breaking through all boundaries and all limitations in the most powerful way possible. Nisan, of course, has two letters. The Gemara says every word that has two nuns is Nisen Nisim Nasuleis. Not just miracles, but miracles of miracles. And a miracle, as Chassidus explains, the Rebbe cites it often, Arim Nisis, from the word of a flag, lifting a flag, Arim Nisi ala Harim. It rises above and raises everything with it. May this month, therefore, raise and rise and lift us up to the greatest heights. So with that, I think a good place to begin, which we've already begun, is talk about Chaydash Nisan, the month of Nisan, 
and uh, the details around it and what we learn from it. So is this chassidus applied? It's applying chassidus to every aspect of life. And chassidus emphasizes, Teira in general is melosh and heira. Teira gives us directive, guidance, and especially chassidus primisad teira gives us direction and guidance, especially in an internalized way, in an integrated way, in every area of our lives. So the best place to begin in the words of the Alter Rebbe is to live with the times. So as I said, as we approach the month of Nisan, literally in the, in the coming days, let's talk about Nisan a little more in detail. So I already mentioned that the Nisan is the month of Gula. It's the month not only of Gula, but this is a time when we're, we're promised that the that Gula Asida will also be in the month of Nisan. Nisan is the month of miracles. Nisan Nisim, as just mentioned. So when we're coming to Rishchidosh Nisan, Rishchidosh, of course, is like a Rish, a head, just like the head encompasses the entire body, and it's like the central nervous system that controls the entire body, the head of a month is the head and the central nervous system that controls the entire month. So everything that will be happening this month is guided by Rish Chedesh. And Rish Chedesh is mentioned, it's the beginning, the whole story of Yitzhiz Mitzrayim begins, HaChedesh HaZel Lachem, Rishon Hu Lachem Hashanah. When Hashem points to Moshe and points to the moon and tells Moshe, here, this is the moon. And this is the moon that you will, you will live by and you will count by and you will be sanctified by. And just as the moon is renewed, hey, masid in this chadish, come here, say, you will be renewed. And the very word chadish, ha chadish hazalachem, comes from the word chidush, like the renewal of the moon. And indeed, the Jewish people are compared to the moon and are similar to the moon in the sense wax and wane, constant changes, but always to be reborn, even when it looks like it's about to completely wane and you don't see anything, a new, born is, a new moon is born. <coughs> Which tells us, of course, the lesson of renewal, the lesson of never giving up, the lesson that even when things sometimes seem dark, the night is dark, but the moon shines. And even when it's so dark that you don't even see anything, the moon is reborn. All these are personal lessons in our lives, and we look at the moon now in the sky, we could say the same moon that Moshe looked at 3,336 years ago. In Mitzrayim, when Hashem pointed to him, the same moon. You know, we know the moon and the sun are like witnesses. Hazino Hashemayim v'sishma sa'orat zimrifi. They're witnesses. They're witnesses throughout history. They were throughout, through, they lived with all our ancestors and parents and grandparents. And that same moon, like the same as the sun, but in this case we're talking about the moon, reminds us, and not just reminds us, it is living with us. Say, just as I was renewed back then, I'm renewed now again. And this year, Tov Shem Pei Dalet, may that moon serve exactly as that renewal. So in case you're ever in a state where you feel a little down, where you feel a little um, depressed, or feel resigned, go outside, look at the moon. And think about Moshe Rabbeinu standing and looking at the moon, Hashem saying to him, Chedesh HaZelachem, here's the new moon. You and the people will be renewed. And in two weeks from now, you'll be redeemed from Mitzrayim. The same thing here in two weeks from now, we will celebrate Pesach. So, That's our strength, that's our power. And the moon stands as witness to that power. So though every new moon, of course, has this message, but it comes to the new year of the new moon, meaning the new lunar year, which we begin to count, is the power, it's like the Rosh Hashanah, of the lunar cycle, the cycle of renewal, as well as the cycle of miracles. As the Akedus Yitzchak brings, cited often in different Maimonim, Akedus Hazem, Maimonim, that there are two ways to know the greatness of God. One is through nature, the consistency of nature, Lo Yush Besu, the sun rising exactly the same time, predictable, accurate, precise. That's one way. That's the, that we learn Rosh Hashanah, Tishrei. That's the, the Rosh Hashanah of the Hanhagah Sateva, Hanhagah of nature. And the second way to know godliness and the divine is when you see God suspending the laws of nature. Shidud Marochi Sateva. And that's Nisan, Nisan Nisim. Open miracles. So the miracle of nature is also a great miracle. And in many ways, sometimes even greater. But it's malubish in nature. It's malubish in the consistency. Here we're talking about the, getting beyond nature. 
And that's what Nisim does. That's what Nisim do. A Ness lifts us up and breaks through. You know, human beings at times, we need that. So even though every nature is miracle, as the Baal Shem Tov says, that the difference between a natural event and a miracle is only frequency. But human nature is such that when you see a novelty, something fresh, something different, something, it has that type of element of a wake-up call. And that's the Rosh Hashanah of the Hanhogenesis in this, as the Akedah Sitzchak and Chassidus explains. Obviously, we want to integrate both of these. And that's the ultimate goal. That it should be a combination of both. So here's what we have this month as we go into the, the month of Nisan, Rosh Chedesh Nisan, all of this stands in the Rosh Chedesh of HaChedesh Azal Lechem, Yishin Hu Lechem Lechot Sheashon. Okay. <coughs> so someone asked a question in addition to what we just discussed. More specifically, we know we have the Miznik that saying the Nasi, we say the Yud Beis Nisim, the first 12 days of Nisan. The Nisim that we read in Parashim Nase, where they, they, each one, as they brought their offerings to dedicate the Mishkan. Now, the technical reason is because Rosh Chedesh Nisan is also the day when they erected, they established the Mishkan. So then began the dedication of the different offerings that the Nisim, the leaders of each tribe, brought. Rosh Chedesh Nisan, they took 10 crowns. So it has many, many powerful significance the month of the day of Rosh Chedesh Nisan. But one of them is also the st- establishment of the Mishkan, which of course is a monumental historic event. For us the Migdash Rishachanti Besecham, the idea that God says, build for me a Mishkan and I will dwell among you. So every Rosh Chedesh Nisan we recreate that experience of building from our lives. Rishachanti Besecham within each one of us. Besech kol echad v'achas Yisrael and each man and woman and child of Jews, of the Eden, that we build a Mishkan for Hashem. So a question was asked, what's the significance of saying the daily Nasi, the first 12 days of Nisan? As I said, the technical reason is for what we said, what would I mention, because that's when the Mishkan, the temple sanctuary was established. So we recreate that. But it goes further than that. The word Nasi actually sounds like the word Nes, even though Nes with a Samach, Nasi with a, with a, with a Sin, but the idea is the same idea, Nasi es reish b'nei Yisrael. Kisisa es reish b'nei Yisrael. It's an element also of lifting up and rising, like Arim Nisi ala Arim. So there's that commonality. And that's what a Nasi is. What a Nes, a miracle does to, in, in their life experiences, a Nasi among the people is the Nasi, the leader, that lifts everyone up. His, his in is to Ufe, famous story, you may have heard about Yossel, Yossel Weinberg, Yossel Weinberg, who um, was a chosid and an askin for many years, was uh, once want, was once wrote a note to the Rebbe and uh, about a, a dangerous situation. One of his one of his balabatim, one of the people he knew, was a child. I think was not well. He wanted to get this note into the Rebbe as fast as possible, but it was already late in the evening. The Rebbe was still in his office, but it was after the time that the secretary, the, the last time he would go into the Rebbe to bring the Rebbe all the tzetlach of that, the end of the, that, that day. But what do you do? So one of the secretaries said to him, Rabbi Chadakov, who always was the Rebbe's chief of staff, who always goes into the Rebbe at the end of the day, before the Rebbe goes home, something like 11.30 at night, <laughs> approximately. So Rabbi Chadakov is now by the Rebbe. So a good idea may be is when he comes out from the Rebbe's office, so put the door, the letter, either give it to him or put it in the door, in the crack of the door, and uh, when he comes out, so they'll see the letter and they'll go to the Rebbe. Because the Rebbe usually would leave right after that, straight to his car, straight going back home. Okay, so that's what he did. He put the letter in the crack of the door, of the Rebbe's door, hope, hoping that when Rabbi Chazakov comes out and the Rebbe follows him, that uh, the, 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 they'll see the letter and the Rebbe will take the letter with him. But Hashem has his ways. So as Hashem would have it, everything has its own way. Rabbi Chadakov came out first from the door. And as he came out, the letter that was in the crack fell on the floor. The Rebbe saw it fell on the floor, so the Rebbe bent down to pick it up. And he walked out with it. Rabbi Weinberg, who was watching all of this, was very disturbed. 
He caused the Rebbe to bend down to pick up the letter. They were very disturbed. He right away wrote another letter that he gave to the Rebbe right away in the morning, apologizing that he caused the Rebbe to bend down to pick up the letter. That was not his intention. His intention was, as he explained, that Rabbi Chavikov would see it, then he would pick it up and give it to the Rebbe. The Rebbe circled that you shouldn't have agmas nefesh, shouldn't be aggravated by the fact that I picked, that I picked it up. This is my whole inyan, the Rebbe said, is to lift up, is to ufeb. Ufeb. Ubefrat, das was anderem fazen. And especially things that others have didn't notice, that were left unnoticed by others. Unbelievable answer. Nose, anosi, to ufeb. So, so, so in the month of Nisan, which is also, Rosh is also the Rosh Hashanah l'Nesim, the Melachim, says Rosh Hashanah for the kings. So that's why we say the Nasi. The, the month itself is about uplifting. Moshe Rabbeinu was the first Nasi. He uplifted through the Nisim that happened in Nisim. And every Rebbe does the same. So that's one of the deeper meanings in why we say the Nasi every day, because every Nasi, the Nasi for each one of the 12, for the 12 tribes, um, that so the twelve days of Nisan we say the Nasi. One more interesting point to make is the Sikha from the Rebbe Vayikra Tovshim Mem Zayin, one of the classics, where um, the Rebbe speaks exactly about this: how Nisan is a month of Nisim, and talks about the saying of the Nasi, and that we all, each one says, even though the Nasi is of one tribe, and we're not from all from every person has their not, uh, their shaved their tribe, and yet there's the Nasi and the shaved within each one of us. And there the Rebbe also alludes to the fact that his own birthday is Yud Aleph Nisan, is in the month of Nisan, Nasi of Bnei Osher, and, um, and talks deeply about the Nitzchis, the eternity of Nisim. It's a very powerful sicha, connecting also to Beis Nisan, the second day of Nisan, which is, of course, the Yemis Talkus and Hilula of the Rebbe, Nishmas, the, the Rebbe Nishmose Eden, the Rebbe Rashab, and talks about the eternity of Anasi and all everything that he did, and even his very belongings, all lives on eternally to, through, to, to, and, sh- and shines into his students and his Talmidim and Sqsidim. So all this comes to teach us that we have the Nasi with us, we have all the Nasim with us, and they give us, continue to give us power, especially in times like this where we need it more than ever. Okay. <coughs> so when we say the Nasi, we are emphasizing that point. Are the miracles of Nisan within or above the natural order? So as I explained, it clearly is above the natural order on the most basic level because there's both levels of Nisan. There's the miracles, as I said, miracles that are in nature, and then the miracles that are clearly suspend nature. Now can you say Nisan also includes those miracles? I mean, it includes all miracles, but the primary Miracles of, of Nisan and Pesach are connected to revealed ones. So that's the natural, that's the obvious answer. And it lifts up everything in life and everything about our lives, including the natural order. Based on that, the next question asks, a question asks, if I understand correctly, the difference between the miracles of Purim and Pesach are that during Purim, the miracles come in a hidden and natural manner, and people didn't realize they were miracles as they were occurring. During Pesach, there were supernatural miracles that everyone saw with their physical eyes, such as the splitting of the Sea of Reeds. Therefore, if Pesach comes during Nisan, which is named for miracles, should we expect to see a month of supernatural miracles with our physical eyes, especially two big miracles we need, which is the safe return of the hostages and the full revelation of Mashiach? The answer is absolutely yes. That's exactly the point we're making here. Remember, time is energy. These are not just we're talking about events that happened once. The time of Nisan is a t- the energy of Nisim, of miracles, and of all sorts and every and, and open ways of every sort. So yes, the, the safe return of the hostages, the victory in this war, the Gula Mitzvah Vashleim. That's exactly what this is all about. And uh, uh, nothing we don't. We don't have to add anything more to that statement. That's the simple fact, and that's what we're praying for and hoping for and believing in and trusting that will happen. 
right here, right, even before the beginning of Nis. <coughs> okay. Now that we covered the Shechesh Nisan, the next day is Beis Nisan. So we mentioned Beis Nisan. It's the 104th Hilul Yorzeit and, uh, of the Rebbe Rashab, Rebbe Nishmes Eden, Tov Reshpei Beis Nisan. We're now in Tov Shin Pei Dalad. We have a, a very heart-wrenching and powerful account of a, in Ashkafta the Rebbe, the Rabbi, Rabbi Rolifkin, the Chosid, who witnessed it all at the time, talks to us and t- describes exactly what happened then that the days before Beis Nissen. Very powerful to read. I've, I've reviewed it a number of times in this program. Just to see a Rebbe, a Rebbe transitioning, and literally tears your heart open how the Rebbe Rashab the last moments of his life and his connection to his son and to his family, to the chassidim. And that's when the Rebbe Rashab said the famous words, he has to be taken out to the base medrash, where he would chazim my morich chassidus. And vozak the Rebbe, one of his last things that he says before is the stalkus. I'm going to heaven, and the writings I leave to you. And the Rebbe explains why does he have to tell us this. Because he's saying that as I am in heaven, you have me here on earth through my ksovim, through my writings. A non nafsi ksovis yehovis. A tzaddik puts himself, invests himself, and completely inserts himself, just like the Eibushter. A nechi, a non nafsi ksovis yehovis. That I know, I, my naf, my nafshi, my soul, ksovis yehovis. I give it to you in these words, that the words of a tzaddik deim lebeira. Tzadikim Dem Lebeiram, that with the words of a tzaddik, his writings capture his very essence. So when we learn his Maimarim, we're learning him. Eishi Atam Lekim is the expression. Taking him himself, that's his whole essence, is, is in this Torah. So on their Beis Nisan, appropriate to learn something from the Rebbe Rashab. I, of course, you may know, give a shir every day in the Rebbe Rashab, Maimarim, I am Beis, which we finished already, but now we're looking at the source material to understand where the Rebbe Rashab would have gone since he didn't finish the Hemshech Hayim Beis in writing. So um, learn something from the Tera of the Rebbe Rashab. And of course, implementation. The Rebbe Rashab established Hemchet Mimim. They established basically training grounds for our generation, the students of our generation, to go out to Kol HaYetzel and Mechemes Beis David, to talk about war, to go out to the war of Mechemes Beis David, which is both a physical war and a spiritual war. Spiritual war, bringing clarity, teira, teira semes, to fight the waves of ignorance and assimilation. And with what? With the light of teira and primis teira. As he explains in Kuntr Seitz Achaim, the Kuntris he gave out in connection with the yeshiva that he established in Tofresh Nun Zayin. So that we honor Beis Nissen through that rededication. Beis Nissen, of course, is also, as the Rebbe points out, the beginning of the Nesias of the Friedrich Rebbe, as the Shkafta, the Rebbe tells us that the, the, Rebbe, the Rebbe Rashab told the Friedrich Rebbe that he should say a Maimir. So Friedrich Rebbe didn't want to say it in public, so he said a Maimir, Eish is great, Mamolik. He said it in front of Rabbi Rifkin, but Rabbi Rifkin left the door open, he told Chassidim. And the, the last Maimir of the Rebbe Rashab becomes the first Maimir of the Friedrich Rebbe, where he talks actually about the Nitzchis of Tzadikim, as cited in the Sikh of Aikra Tav Shemem Zayin that I mentioned earlier. Well, I've talked about this also in previous years, Beis Nissen. We talked about Nisias, so it's also part of the whole Nisias of this month of Nissen, of lifting and elevating us all, giving us even more strength in the miracles and the redemption and Geula of this special month. Someone wrote, writes about, are we, about honoring this day business and, and adds, I love Samachvav and I am based too. These are the two Magnum Opus, the two majors, Hamshe, Hamshechim, which is a series of discourses that the Rebbe Rashab left us. The Yusaydis, the found Yusaydis of Chassidus, the Rebbe calls it the Nefloyis Yusaydis, and I am based is Nefloyis, even compared to the wonders and Nefloyis of Samachvav, Hamshech Samachvav. Now, living with the times, let us move now to the Parsha. This week, being that it's a leap year, some of the Parshas that are usually connected, like Sazriya and Mitzayda, are separate. So Sazriya and then Mitzayda. 
Now, Parsha Sazi has interesting cha- chapters it's full of, with, filled with paradox. On one hand, Isha Kisazriya Vyalda Zachar is talking about birth. When a woman will, when a woman will bear a Sazriya, will bear a child. So it's talking about the birthing. But then it goes on to talk about the impurities. The impurities of birth, the impurities connected to other forms of, of, uh, of uh, the impurities that the Torah tells us. So you have here this interesting paradox. On one hand, birth, as we know, it says in Svarim, Chassidus brings, Isha Kesazriya, is also talking about Isha Knesset Yisrael, the Jewish people, as they will bear, what? The old Zohar talking about the Geula. After Golis, is the bearing of Geula, which is compared to the old Zohar, Shir Zohar. And the Lassid Lavi, the song that will be sung, will be in the, language, in the masculine. So it's talking about the general Aveda of a person. And yet, we also talk about the impurities. So the obvious answer is, because we don't have the Geula yet, so, this, so with all we have great revelations like Geula, but at the same time, as, as birthing, which refers to the Geula, but we also have the Chavle Leda, the pains that bring to that. And pain is connected to Tuma. Tuma is like ta- spiritual toxins, spiritual impurities. And the greater the revelation, the greater sometimes you have to go through the darkness that leads to that. There's also a, there's also a Sefer Yitzhida that cited the Sefer Yitzhida that cites that in lamaylo ma'enig ve'en lamata menega. The word enig, which means pleasure, the highest level of tainug, of keser and primis keser, primis atik, the deepest level of pleasure, of enig, ayin lairasa, eidn ila, this talks about tainug built in murgish, the highest level of pleasure. Saying the sava kodesh baruch that God desired to have a home in this lowest of worlds. Nesava, from the word taiva, tainug, that's the highest. And everything starts from Tainuk. Then you come Rotsen. And then comes Chachm and Bina and the, and the imminent and, and the Kechis Primim, the, the Svidas that are the conscious faculties. So even though Chassidus talks who's higher, Rotsen or Tainuk, at the end of the day, Tainuk is the highest level. Even though some things, some areas, and some instances, and some from certain perspectives, Rotsen has a higher power. But at the end of the day, it's always Tainuk. As the Rebbe explains, a very p- powerful Sikha, Vayesh of Tovshin Lamed Zayin. If you want to look in- into it, you can see a very powerful Sikha about this point. But in Lamata Menega, the same letters Enig also make up the word Nega. Nega is what? From the word from, from, from uh, Mitzayda. Nega is leprosy. Nega is an impurity. In Lamata Menega. So Chassidus explains that these are connected because to reach the greatest level, you have to transform the lowest level. So a question came in on this about Pasha Sazria, like this. The Rebbe is a leper compared to Golos and is its healing compared to Gula? The answer is absolutely yes. And the Gemara in Sanhedrin actually talks about Mashiach having kinds of wounds the wounds of a Mitzayra. And he's wrapping his wounds. So you see clearly where it says from the Psukim, the Rebbe brings at the end of the Maimur, Bas Lagani Tovshin Yud Aleph, that Mashiach will, will absorb our pain and our suffering. But at the same time, Mashiach, of course, indicates the greatest level revelation. And it's in, interdependent. The dark, deepest darkness brings the greatest revelation. If I, so someone writes, did the Rebbe once say that Golis is compared to a leper, just like the leper achieved, rev- achieved revealing a high level of spiritual energy but didn't have the proper vessels to contain it? So the misalignment of body and neshama manifests as a spiritual disease. So too there are many revealed lights in Golis, and when we find the right containers to hold it, we will achieve Gaula. We can achieve Gaula. My question is, what are the proper containers to achieve being able to hold and manifest the immense energy of Gaula? Where, where, do, where do we find these containers and how do we maintain them that they function properly and do their job properly? So, so yes, indeed, based on Tere, the Kute Tere in the Parsha Sazir, Mitzayri talks about that Mitzayri is the idea that technically 
that there's a part of patch of uh, flesh that becomes white, the blood is drained from it. So he explains that it's like the chokhmah is being drained from bina, so it leaves a certain vacuum. And that's what creates the spiritual malady called mitzedah, as the Rambam writes, it's a spiritual illness, not a physical one. So, that, so in other words, it's the result of dissonance. What's the solution to dissonance? Is reconnecting. So when Metzedah goes to the Koyin, Koyin is a level of Chochmeh, and his Mam Sheh Chochmeh, he rejuvenates and refreshes that flow of blood. In Ruchni is the reconnection between the divine and existence, between body and soul. So based on that, David is exactly that. Before Chet Eitzadas, before they ate from the tree of knowledge, there was a seamlessness between Adam and Chava and God's will. That's why they were not ashamed from being naked. Because it's part of God's plan. A, a newborn child is not ashamed. It's only when there's a self-consciousness that entered, a dissonance that was created. Eight sadas, they began to be conscious of themselves as a separate entity from godliness. That dissonance now created, brought zuma, brought nega, brought toxins into the world. And now you need a ticket for that. And ever since, we've been repairing that. So Golis represents the dissonance, the spiritual dissonance. How do you create the Kalim? By realigning ourselves to Hashem. By realigning our lives, our bodies, our very physical beings to what God wants. That's repairing that dissonance. When you connect to the coin, to the Nasi, the Nasi helps elevate a person and, and, and be able to reconnect the things that are disconnected. That's on a very basic level. Which answers another question someone asked. How do we change? What do we have to do to do in order to change the letters of Nega, the leprosy of Golas, to Eneg, the pleasure of Geula? So this is the essence of Tshuva. This Deinus Nasalei Kazachis. When you take your Nega, and everybody, Kol Adam Reye Kol Negoyim Adam Reye Chutz Menegoyim Atzmei. We see all blemishes except our own. When a person, however, corrects his own blemish, and that's through tshuva, so they, not just you eliminate the blemish, it gets transformed, nega, to enek, to the greatest pleasure. They, can't, they don't even have the capacity to stand there. It's a whole different qualitative level. The Aveda in Golis, in this harsh Golis, transforming darkness to light, creates something that no one, no nashamis and no malachim and at the highest levels can achieve. One hour of tshuva ma'asim tevim outweighs kol chay elam hab. Everything you know about the world to come. Because of this qualitative power of fulfilling the sava kodesh baruch hu, the tainu glamayla. Nachas ruch lafani v'amati v'amati v'nasad etseni, the tainu glamayla, enig, through what? In this darkness where there's nega, when you transform that, you reach the highest level of enig. So each one of us in our own personal way, and of course collectively all of us together, and we've been told, we're already at the threshold, we finished the job, it's just a few little things that need to be, we have to open our eyes and, and need to become conscious and aware of it. <coughs> So, this, okay. Since we're on it, I'll just say one more thing. Someone asked a question since we've just read from Pasha Shmini. So the question was asked, what's the connection between Pasha Shmini and the arrival of Mashiach? Okay, so Shmini, we, we discussed, which is the day of, of actually of Rosh Chedesh Nisan. Shmini, as the Rajbo says, Chesidus bring sites, the number seven is the cycle of time, cycle of life, the cycle of the midas, the emotions. Shmini is shemir as a hekef. It's a transcendent energy that protects, that hovers above the structure. That's why Shmini is connected so much to Mashiach, Shmini Nesichi Adam. The level of transcendence. That's the short answer, and therefore it makes sense that leads right into Sazria, which is the the Yolda, Zohar, the birth of Geula that comes from the darkness. So everything is Ashgacha Pratis. So a good segue 
is straight into latest events. So let's talk now about some of the latest events. And namely, we'll talk about the solar eclipse that's coming tomorrow, as well as the surprising and unexpected earthquake that happened in the East Coast, the place of the Rebbe's central headquarters, the Rebbe's place where he davened and learned for so many years, as well as the Friedrich Rebbe, that happened on Friday, as mentioned before. So I got a lot of questions on this. I'll try to consolidate them to a few key ones. And let's talk about that. What do we learn from the upcoming solar eclipse and the recent East Coast earthquake? So let's start with the eclipse, and then we'll go back to the earthquake. Even though in events it happens the other way around. So both of these things, like natural events on one hand, but they're different. That's why they get our attention. Besides the fact that they can be dangerous, um, but most importantly, they're different. It's not through the regular schedule, which is one of the simple lessons in that is, it's like a wake-up call to remind us that it's not, uh, don't, don't take life for granted. There's something else going on in every given situation. So let's start, as I said, with the eclipse. Is the eclipse a negative sign? So we know the story in Gemara, Sukkah, or someone writes, I'll just read a few. Is the eclipse a sign that Hashem is angry at us and wants, us to, wants to take more light away from us? Another person writes, does it say anywhere in the Torah that an eclipse represents a great concealment such as when Mashiach ben Yosef will be killed? Okay. Well, I'll read some more afterwards, but let me just go back. So there's the Gemara in Sukkah, Tav Chavtes, Ahmed Beis, where it talks about Hama'eris Lakin, when the luminaries will be eclipsed. There's, of course, a lunar eclipse, there's a solar eclipse. Here we're talking about a solar eclipse. So in general, it talks about it being not a positive omen. First of all, an eclipse, by definition, means you're like concealing light. But so people feel something to be afraid of. So the Rebbe has a classic sikhi where he talks about this. He talked about this in Tavshin Lamed Hay. I remember it. It was Pasha Shlach. Twice a year, there'd be a pikisha where college students came to Crown Heights. And they would celebrate Shabbos and Fabring and so on. The Rebbe would, in most cases, dedicate a talk to them. One was around Hanukkah time, the holiday season time, around December. So usually the sikhi the Rebbe would speak to them would be Pasha Vayeshev or Miketz. And the other time was in the beginning of the summer, Pasha Shlach. This was Pasha Shlach, Tav Shalamet Hay. That year, the Rebbe actually talked about two things. Computers, which were just coming onto the scene. And there was a lunar eclipse at the time. I believe it was a lunar eclipse. And the Rebbe spoke about it at length. It later became a sikhe, in the Kutis Sikhe's Chelik Tezvah of Neyach, where he talks about eclipses. Of course, the obvious question is, Today we know an eclipse is something you can calculate. So what do you mean? How could it be a sign, as the Gemara says, from bad behavior? That did we know before and there'll be bad behavior? It's predestined. It's not. So the Rebbe's answer was a classic. He brought from many different commentaries. Classic answer. It's a predisposition. No, it's not compelling us. There are times, energy is time. It looks like the month of other we say, it's a time, it's an opportune time for certain things. Month of Ov is not such an opportune time for certain things. So it's not saying that this is predetermined, a certain fatalism, it has to happen. It's saying there are times. So even though we know we know the calculations, lunar and solar eclipses, nevertheless, it doesn't matter what we know. There are times that we know ahead of time, there'll be times that are like so-called low times, and there are high times. Low tide, high tide. <clears throat> which is actually dependent on the moon. And there's a long sikh, I'm not going to go into detail. So we shouldn't look at it as a negative sign. On the contrary, we should look at it as an opportunity. An opportunity to be able to strengthen ourselves and achieve greater things. Now, you go further, you read further in the Gemara, it actually says that a solar eclipse is a bad sign for the, the nations because they count by the sun. A lunar eclipse is a bad sign for the Jews because they count by the moon. But again, as we said, it's not a sign. It's a predisposition. And yet the Rebbe makes it very clear that there are tremendous positive lessons that we can learn from this. So someone writes that 
people who are afraid of the eclipse and saying it's a bad omen because the Gemara says eclipses are punishments for particular sins. So the Goyim used the sun and we use the lunar system. The moon blocking out the light of the sun is clearly a sign that although we are only 15 million people versus 8 billion people that don't like us, by doing Teirah and Mitzvahs, we have the power to block them out completely and restore the Davidic kingdom of Mashiach, which is compared to the moon. Go moon, Mashiach, power, Mashiach now. Well, as I said, even when it says that, and it's true, it does say that, maybe that's a good sign now that we're dealing with uh, enemies. Just keep in mind, just for the record, it's, not rega- it's a completely different topic that the Muslims count by the moon. The Gregorian calendar of the West that counts by the sun. And they didn't count by the moon, but they reconcile it with the solar cycle. Islam as a footnote. But fine. Halavai that Hashem Shataka do that and so on. But there's more to it. When you look, there's a, a, a very interesting sikh that the Rebbe said, he spoke to the women, Echov Dalad El, Tov Shinun Aleph. A little before that, in the summer, there was both a lunar eclipse and a solar eclipse. And the Rebbe speaks there about how we learn Godless Hashem, the greatness of Hashem, from the movements of the celestial bodies, including, of course, the luminaries, the sun and the moon. And then he talks about eclipse. That eclipse as well teaches us that there's someone, there's someone that's running the show. Because you see, anything that moves has to cause something, something has to cause it to move. That's in general. But especially when the times of an eclipse and you see the moon and sun interacting in certain ways. And they're not affected by it ultimately. Because after the eclipse, let's say the solar eclipse, the sun goes back to its original strength. Usually if something is weakened, it takes time for it to get back to its usual strength. All this demonstrates Hashem's hand. So these events, the Rebbe said, are events that should be looked at as signs that teach us about God and about God's greatness. Even if there's a negative element, the point is to wake us up, which answers the next question. Can we prevent the eclipse if we do, not, if we do enough tshuva before Monday afternoon? We don't have to prevent the eclipse. The eclipse, again, is not, a partic- is not itself a, te- a bad thing. It's, it, it indicates on a challenge and indicates, because also love we know, the sun will be taken out of its sheath. The light of the moon will be like the light of the sun. Definitely represents godly revelation. So darkness, even night, especially an eclipse, can demonstrate a darkness, but a, a certain darkness and concealment. But the point here is that we should use it as an opportunity to do more. Like every setback, if you want to call it such that it's always an experience of something that is to motivate and be a catalyst for something that teaches us to become greater people. So instead of looking at this as a negative, we look at it as it is what it is. First of all, it's Hashem's hand and the power of Hashem and God to be able to run the show. And yes, there is an element of, of, a, of a negative element, but a negative element is also meant to be always a springboard for greater growth. That's how we have to look at it. Since we're talking already about when the Rebbe spoke about it, also, on, um, um, uh, let's see here. Are there other times? Well, that's what, right now, what I have right now. Okay. Someone asked the question, are we allowed to leave yeshiva So what's up? Before we get to them, sorry. What lessons does it offer us? So I described the, described the lessons. Remember, Shemesh and Levana are two of God's luminaries, and they both are necessary. Each one has their power. And when they interact with each other, and even when there's a, a liquid, a eclipse, you know, the eclipse reveals to us sometimes something even greater than the light itself. As we know, the, 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 cor- the corona of the sun which is revealed during an eclipse, teaches us more about sunlight that sometimes you see during a regular bright day. <coughs> and additionally, everything that happens is Ashgacha Pratis, that's a wake-up call to meant to help us look at ourselves, both in a positive way and the negatives to meant to teach us to be more introspective and more soul-searching. So that sums that up. So someone asks, are we allowed to leave Yeshiva to view the eclipse? to leave for a half hour and go outside to watch the once-in-a-lifetime solar eclipse? Or is it bitl teda and regardless of what's going on outside, we need to stay indoors and learn teda? 
So yes, bittel teta is very clear what that is, to do anything that's not learning teta. Now, can I say, it all depends on the individual. If you are a person who's teta osa and learning teta 24-7, then for sure you shouldn't go out. If you're anyway doing things that are not always perfect, <laughs> meaning there's other, other forms where you're not learning teta all the time, and you go out to see the solar eclipse, obviously make sure to wear the special glasses because it could be dangerous. It definitely is dangerous. And most importantly, make sure you learn lessons in Avedis Hashem. So that way it's not even bitl teir. You can use it as Mar Abba Masach Hashem, Agadla Masach Hashem, and Adar Abba learn lessons. Some of them we talked about earlier. So on them added, perhaps our principal can work out a compromise and start yeshiva half hour early on Eclipse Day to make up for the lost time of learning. Well, as I said, there are different ways to approach it, and that's, uh, that's that. So let's move now to the earthquake. The earthquake, Ri'idus Ha'adoma, that's called, Ri'idus Ha'aretz, it's Ha'adoma, is again, besides the fact that it's, uh, it's earth-shattering, literally, it also can reflect some negative things as well. In Chesidus, it talks about the uh, Eira Tere Bereshis, right in the beginning, talks about Idus Adama. Actually, if you look in Sefer Lekutim, there's an Erech, an entry called the Idus Adama. It quotes that Maimer. I know personally because I worked in Sefer Lekutim, that was one of the Erechim I chose. So I studied it, Eretz Hodim Ragli, and it, it talks about also being somewhat of a negative omen. But like, again, negative things are only meant to be to, to motivate us. So a few, a few questions that came in. Does it say anywhere that immediately preceding Mashiach's arrival there will be earthquakes? You know what? I'm going to go first to a question before that, before we get to that. What are we to make of the recent earthquake in the tri-state area? So again, everything is as We don't ignore it. We see it as a wake-up call. The things are not regular. The earth is shaking. It means, what are you doing to hold up the earth? We know, three things that the world stands on, three pillars. The more you learn, the more Aveda davening, the more stokich, the stronger the foundations of the earth are. At the end of the day, the Ebrishta establishes earth. So an earthquake is, a, again, a form of dissonance. We spoke before about dissonance. It's just dissonance, just like the sun and the moon. Dissonance. Dissonance is meant to wake us up. As a matter of fact, in one of the sikhs of the Rebbe many years ago, Purim Tafshan Chav, there was an earthquake, I believe, in North Africa, maybe Morocco, not sure where it was, where the Rebbe spoke about it. That that's a time to add, find more Talmidim, the yeshiva was missing a Talmud, to increase some more learning teda, and that's what creates more consistency, more more solidity and more foundational elements that hold up the earth. That's the obvious lesson. When I was speaking with the, guy, the hostage, the, the released hostage from Argentina, so the earthquake happened right in the middle of our speaking. And we were mamish talking about it. I said, look what kind of miracle you, you've experienced. And it's a wake-up call to all of us. And right then the earthquake happened. It was, was a shake, you know. We all got shaken up. And it was a, a lesson. It's a lesson. That's called wake-up calls. Okay, so then someone asks, as I just said, is, um, are earthquakes a sign of Mashiach's imminent arrival? Does it say anywhere that immediately preceding Mashiach's arrival there will be earthquakes, or are earthquakes just a collective punishment? They're not a punishment. There's no such thing as punishments. It's cause and effect. And is it a wake-up? Yes. I don't recall seeing a medrash that says connecting directly to Mashiach, but I... Mashiach, but I may be wrong about that. <clears throat> if anyone has a source, please let me know. <clears throat> I know that the Rebbe did speak about earthquakes, which I'll share with you now. Lag Ba'imr Tov Shinun, and then Kairach Tov Shinun Aleph. Both of them, and I mentioned already Purim Tov Shin Chof. In both places, the Rebbe spoke about earthquakes, that it should not frighten us, it should be a wake up call. And on the contrary, we should strengthen ourselves and see it as such. So that's in general the attitude when you have Betochen Ba'ashem and the Ebrishter is running the world. 
And finally, the person asks, is there any significance to the number 4.8, the magnitude of the earthquake and the date of the eclipse, which is on April 8th? And I'll read the question. We would like to hear Rabbi Jacobson's thoughts on the following. We think we are clearly more than ever at the threshold of Mashiach's time. The verse in Exodus 4, 8, verse 4, uh, uh, chapter 4, verse 8 says, And it shall come to pass, if they will not believe thee, neither hearken to the voice of the first sign, that they will believe the voice of the latter sign. On Friday, New York had a 4.8 scale earthquake. And on Monday, 4 8, 2024, will be a full eclipse. Is there any significance to the number 4.8, which can tell us what will happen soon and what we need to do to be prepared? 4 plus 8 equals 12. We are taught that 11 represents a supernatural consciousness above the natural order of 10. But what does 12 represent? Is it another level of supernatural, a step above the 11th level? Could it mean the 12 tribes? Could it mean the end of the 12th month? Especially since we will go from two scary events right into Rosh Chodesh Nisan the first month, a month of redemption and a month of open miracles. May we joyously see redemption, redemptive open miracles, especially the biggest miracle, which is the full revelation of Mashiach. And may we soon see the Rebbe again in a physical body within 10 Tvachim, Matam Asar Tvachim from the ground. And may we joy, may joyously dance with us as we enter the third base of together to see and appreciate how God's essence is manifest and revealed in our physical world. Amen. I don't know if I'm equipped to be able to answer the question about being able to read in all these numbers. It's very interesting. I'm glad that you wrote it, and I'm glad to share it. And may people read and understand it as they see fit. Remember, the Rebbe Rashab once said about learn, saying Pshat in Tanya. He says he doesn't like when people say Pshat Lach in Tanya, commentary in Tanya. But if it adds a year to Shemayim, he doesn't mind. So I can't tell you, you know, if the Rebbe said this, obviously it's an absolute authority. So it's, it's interesting. Everything is divine providence. The verse 4, 8, and the dates, and the, and the magnitude, and the number 12. But if it adds in Yerushalayim, then by all means, that's why I'm reading it, because it, can, if it inspires us to see that we're at a point in, in right in the beginning, as we enter month of Nisan, a state of Nisan, of lifting us up, and a solar eclipse, a, full, a complete solar eclipse, in a big part of uh, the United States, and, me, and I think across the entire world will be a partial polar, uh, solar eclipse, there's no question, it's a wake-up call. It lifts our spirits. It can wake us up and, and, and lift us up, like I said, with Nisim and Nose, and Nosi. And same thing with the earthquake. If it's done that way, and these hints, the 4-8 helps. Like he says, there's a first sign and then a second sign. By all means. And the litmus test is very straightforward. What are the results? If it adds, and should add, to each of us strengthening our Teir Avedi Mils Chasadim, like I mentioned, the three pillars that hold up the earth, and not just the earth, the entire heaven as well, including the sun and the moon, then absolutely, then this becomes part of, of our Veda, and these events then become a Kiddush Hashem because we have used them to help us become more connected to God. And in this month of, Nes, of Nisan, of Nisan Nisim, it also helps us prevail over all our challenges. So it tells us that even though there may be an eclipse, and there may be an eclipse, figuratively speaking, we will always shine even greater and greater and, and march into the Gula Amitiz Vashlem. Okay. Since we're talking now about that, let's go over to the war. Questions continue to come in about this, and here's a good opportunity that if anybody wants to ask a question, please go to chsidasupply.com. We could ask a forum, complete, confidential, anonymous question that cannot be traced because it's completely whatever you write. If you want to write your email address because you want some information or a response, then you can do so, but you don't have to. So that's an opportunity, and I encourage you to use this opportunity. So here's a few questions that came in about the war in Gaza. Let's address that. As we move along, Rabbi Jacobson. Why are we always on the defense and not on the offense? Detail, Rabbi Jacobson. I wish to share with you some ideas that I heard on a podcast. <clears throat> we, the Jewish nation, are still very much living in the shtetl. We tiptoe around the other nations. 
We only fight defensively against sworn enemies who wish to wipe us off the map. How can we open our eyes to Mashiach when we don't have the courage to say who we are, where we belong, and why we are here? Aren't we Hashem's conduit, the people chosen to bring holiness to the world? We need to fight offensively. How can any country win a war by fighting in defense all of the time? We as a nation need to wa- need a wake-up call. We are the chosen people. We have a mission on earth. How can we get to Mashiach without being open, honest, and willing to fight in offense mode? Isn't it time? These ideas scared me, but the more I thought about them, I realized that it's so true. I'm interested in your thoughts. Thank you. Well, I'm glad. I'm not sure who you heard it from, but I'm glad that you did, and I'm glad that it was said. I, I will not... Uh, uh, this is not a personal matter, but I will say that I've talked about this myself many, many times. It's one of my central themes. But the best defense is offense. It's not just about don't kill us, but it's that we stand for something, the Jewish people and Israel. And especially now when there's such focus on anti-Semitism, yes, let's get up. I've never been prouder to be a Jew, as I always say. Let's get up and declare to the world, why is Israel needed? Every one of us has to be able to answer that question. Why are the Jewish people needed? Because we brought God's vision to this world. We brought God's plan, God's mandate, starting from Avram Avinu, the pioneer, Echad Avram, brought morality, all the values that every person on this earth cherishes, even those that hate the Jewish people, all come from Avram Avinu. And then Avram and Sarah, and Yitzchak, and Yaakov, Sarah, Rivka, Rachel, and Leah, Matt and Teda. Not only there's nothing to be ashamed of, we brought it to the world, and now is the time to rise and say that's what we are ultimately fighting for. And every enemy of the Jewish people is not an enemy of the Jews alone. They're an enemy of all morality, all mental kite, all civilization, everything that we stand for, everything that's valuable. So this is a time that the entire world should rise and say, what's going on here? Why are you attacking the Jewish people? The exact opposite should be happening. Embracing the Jewish people, like the Medr says, I often quite quote it, the Rebbe would quote it, that if the non-Jewish world knew the blessings that they received from the Beis Amikdash and from Eretz Yisrael and from the Jewish people, instead of attacking it, they would surround it with legions to protect it because of the blessings they receive. Those that will bless you shall be blessed. So it's time for all of us to embrace that. But we need to get educated. We need to understand. Unfortunately, you meet Jews who don't know. They, they don't understand what, you know, what exactly are the Jewish people's role in this world. And Israel's role. So forget it, I'm not even going to get into a discussion who the oppressor is. We're here to bring, and we have brought, Islam, Christianity, who should they thank for everything that they value, their values, and their standards, and their... Their, uh, what they feel is their destiny. It all comes from the Torah, from Hashem, from Mat and Torah. It's a time to make, create a revolution, an unprecedented revolution in Sheva Mitzvah B'neach, the laws, the universal laws of morality that Hashem gave us. If everybody followed that, we would have no more war, no more famine, no more any of our problems. So by everything you're saying, I will just double and triple so much more so. This is supposed to be exactly what we should be doing. Another person writes, do the nations of the world have any free choice regarding Israel? Raf Simon. On 28th Cheshvan, Tav Shinun, 5750, the Rebbe Nesid told Israeli ambassador to the U.S., Uri Savir, and he sends me the video link. If anybody wants it, just send us in the form in chassidahsupply.com with your email address and we'll be happy to send you the video link. The Rebbe tells him that non yidin don't have free choice regarding Eretz Yisrael. So all those politicians, professors, celebrities, and protesters that support terrorism against us don't have any choice in the matter. Is that correct? Thanks, man. Okay. <laughs> exactly right. The Ebishter runs the show, especially when it comes to Eretz Yisrael. I say show, the Ebishter runs the world, especially when it comes to Eretz Yisrael. 
And if the Eden just did what they had to do, we'd have no issues at all with the nations. So it's the Rebbe's consistent uh, uh, approach. Don't be nispoiled from them. Don't be affected by them. Don't think what, what they're thinking. Obviously, we have to be civil, and diplomatic. Do what you have to do, and the world will ultimately follow and embrace it and respect you for it. So that's the short answer, straightforward. Should we consider their opinions? Listen, if someone's your friend, you always consider their opinion. If they have a good opinion, let's hear it. But first of all, if they're not your friend, then obviously, why is their opinion valuable? They're just trying to undermine you. If they're a friend, yes, you consider it. And even then, and that's the second of all I wanted to say, and even then, you have to weigh all the options and see what the story is. You can't just follow anyone's opinion. It's a survival here. It's a life and death. Who cares more? But by all means, we welcome anyone that cares. But it has to start with the axiom. What is the moral right and wrong here? As soon as you start seeing headlines, which is beyond infuriating, headlines investigating what Israel did, a few people were killed. No one's taking away from being killed. Where are the headlines investigating Hamas allowing and causing the killings of thousands of civilians? The more civilians that they count, the more they should be accountable for that. Where are the headlines? Someone tells me, because we don't even expect anything from them. From, from the Israel, we expect. What kind of statement is that? You don't expect? Like saying the Nazis, we don't expect anything better. That's why it's even more important to hold them accountable and responsible. It's just such an upside-down picture. So we're going to consider the opinions of people who have the whole thing distorted. You understand the reality of what is right and wrong, how Israel is in the right, the moral clarity, the moral certainty, the moral compass that you have. And you have an opinion, then you're a friend of mine, an ally. Of course I'd like to hear what you have to say. Because we're, looking, we're both thinking in the same direction how to preserve freedom, how to protect innocent people, and how to eliminate cynical and demonic terrorists who don't mind to kill their own children just to get what they want. That's what we're going to start considering. Okay. On a more sensitive note, people ask, should religious people be exempt from fighting the war? Someone writes it even sharper. Why do religious people in Israel think they are exempt from serving in the army? They have a lot of nerves saying they don't have to fight because their prayers help protect the country. If their prayers help protect the country, then October 7th wouldn't have happened. Okay, I don't know if I would use so much vitriol on this, but let me say this. First of all, it comes to Pekuach Nefesh. We're all in this together. Someone's in danger. You see a building burning. You don't say, oh, I'm religious. It's your job to go put the fire out or save lives in the building. We're all part of this. So anyone makes such distinctions is completely off. The reason that the Israeli government, from, the, from its inception, allowed a ptur, gave an exemption to students, and Shiva students, is similar to, what, to, to other places. First of all, they're doing a certain important thing, which is being students. Not because somebody wants to get off the hook and trying to find a loophole. And especially when you take into consideration that part of this war is a spiritual war. Melcham Tal fighting the battle through Ruchnius, like Yoyev and Dovid HaMelech, like Moshe and Yeshua. So there's the physical warriors, there's the spiritual warriors. So Abach and Yeshiva, who realizes, I'm fighting a battle and I'm waking up early and I'm not using it as an excuse I sleep till whenever I want, and then I go eat falafel and shawarma, and I, I, I avoid I avoid anything. No, you're fighting a battle equal to those on the front lines. Or you're helping them fight, either by encouraging them, inspiring them, teaching them, putting on film with them, singing and dancing with them, just like chaplains in the army do. Then you're part of the battle, and that's the way it should be. But if a guy just finding an excuse, and just because he happens to go to yeshiva, he's found himself a loophole, I totally agree. There's no place for that. 
Now the question whether it should be a draft to compel people, look, there are people that unfortunately do cut corners, just like people don't pay taxes. So the question is how much to go after them? Do you go after them? And there's also the diplomacy about it, and there's politics, let's be honest, a lot of it is political. If someone in the government needs the political, religious political party support, and the political party say, leave the boys alone from yeshiva, is it right or wrong? Well, what should happen is that the Jewish leaders, the Torah leaders, should be calling upon their students, now's the time of Muhammad. It's not business as usual. You should be learning more. You should be waking up early. You should have the same Kabbalah sale, the same, the same pressure, if you wish. As a soldier in the army, yeah, waking up four in the morning with 300 pounds on his back, climbing up on a wet, on a wet mountain. That's how you should be learning Tater now. And then your partners with the soldiers. That's what should be. What is, is unfortunately not exactly like that. How to deal with it, that is already a question that's not so easy to answer. Because I don't know if the way to do is compel people. Maybe it's to inspire people. Maybe it's to make them aware, not let them hide behind in corners. That would be my response to that question. And I trust that the government, if they do give an exemption, it should be for that reason. How can we recreate today's Moshe holding up his arms to heaven to pray for the victory against Amalek? The Torah says that we only know the war with Amalek as long as Moshe Rabbeinu was able to hold his arms up to heaven. How can we recreate this today to win the war in Gaza and rescue the hostages? We don't have Moshe Rabbeinu today, but we can take the biggest. Ra- but can we take the biggest rabbi available and put him on the roof of 770 and have him extend his arms up? So first of all, we have a Moshe inside each of us, as the Alter Rebbe says in Tanya chapter 42. Secondly. We all have the power of tefillah. Whether it's on the level of Moshe, we just spoke about a partnership here. We should be davening more, saying more tefillin, more passion, and do it with urgency, just like you're fighting a war. And Hashem hears all prayers. And that's absolutely part of the process. And that's what we learned from Moshe Rabbeinu. That's how we recreate it. And I think that's a place where we can stop since time is uh, really tight. May Hashem help that we should do exactly that part. Each of us has our tafkid, as the Rebbe said, Friedrich Rebbe said, that deserting a deserter in a time of war is not someone who is not fighting. It's, not, it's someone who leaves his position. Everyone has their position. There are people fighting on the front lines. There are people in intelligence, people in administration, people in the Air Force, in the Navy, on the land. There are people... In, in, in all different areas. And then there are those that are fighting the spiritual part of the war. We're all in it together. And may finally our efforts yield the ultimate fruit, the safe return of all the hostages. As we march into Nisan Nigalu, Benisan Asidin Ligar. And only good news. We're here every Sunday, 8 to 9 p.m. My life, Chsid is supplied. Thank you. This program is brought to you by My Life, Hasidus Applied. Please help us continue our programs. Make even a small contribution at hasidusapplied.com slash donate.